we are looking at the conceptual foundations of CBA. Conceptual foundations of CBA. So uh, basically, for CBA, Pareto efficiency is a foundation. So uh, when we are undergoing cost benefit analysis, we are just dealing with economic efficiency, of which we use the Pareto efficiency or optimality criteria. Okay. Now, uh, from, from the first time that we, we, we met, we said that basically, whenever we are undertaking a public uh, po policy or we want to allocate resources, for CBA, when we use CBA, it's basically for measuring economic efficiency. There are times where uh, the policy wouldn't just be thinking about economic efficiency. There are times, we saw it the last time we met that there are cases where we have to consider political factors, social factors, and all that. But even if economic efficiency is not the main goal, we can still use CBA to I mean, compare the efficiency of alternative projects. So we can either do project A, B, C, or D. Economic efficiency isn't really the main goal, but then we can use CBA to know whether we have to go for project A or project B, even before we think about the other, other goals or you know, the rationales of the policy. So basically, Pareto efficiency is the, is the basis for uh, cost benefit analysis. Uh, it's a concept developed by Wilfredo Pareto. Okay? Uh, he was an Italian economist. He started using this criteria uh, by studying the economic efficiency and the income distribution. But then now uh, it didn't end there. Modern economists and other uh, social scientists are also using this criterion to uh, do analysis when it comes to resource allocation. So it's something that is why we if you go to the political science department, yeah, yeah, something that we use it extensively. So I, I'm sure from micro last semester, you guys have a fair idea of what Pareto efficiency is. Let's look at the de definition. An allocation of goods is Pareto efficient. At times we call it uh, Pareto optimal. If no alternative arrangement can be found such that at least one person is made better off without making anyone else worse off. So after you have allocated certain resources, you've enacted a policy, then we call that policy a Pareto efficient policy. If it is not possible to do a reallocation of these resources so that at least one person will be made better off and then no other person will get harmed. So if there is no alternative arrangement or reallocation like that, then we say that uh, the initial allocation is Pareto optimum or Pareto efficient. So when we are dealing with the whole economy, it's mostly about allocation of resources among uh, the people that are affected or those who use those resources. So if we are able to do this allocation, and then it is not possible to re allocate these resources among the users such that no one is going to be harmed, but then at least one person will be better. Then we say that that allocation is correct. So, but then as soon as we are able to get another or alternative allocation that will make at least one person better off without harming anyone, then we say the initial allocation is inefficient. Okay, it's correct inefficient. So, that is basically the de definition of the concept of Pareto uh, efficiency. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, the allocation will be inefficient if there is an alternative allocation where at least one person is made better. No one is made better person. So if initially, assuming we have an allocation A, okay, and then it is possible to get an allocation B, where at least one person is made better off without harming anyone. We'll call that certain allocation, a Pareto superior allocation, or it serves as a Pareto improvement allocation. But we are moving from uh, an allocation A to B, where at least one, one person is being made better off 
we now have in one. So that is an improvement over the initial one, or it is superior to the first one. So what this means is that we will have an allocation to be inefficient if we can have a Pareto superior allocation. If we can improve upon the initial allocation, then we say that the initial allocation is inefficient. Inefficient. The Pareto efficiency concept deals with consensus. It is it's like all those who are affected by the allocation will come into an agreement. So if we are not in agreement, then at least one person is being made the better without having any one thing to say that what we have done is Pareto efficient. Uh, this concept, I think one issue is that it doesn't really consider interpersonal. What exactly is happening to individuals? We are unable to confirm this. But irrespective of this challenge, this is the most widely concept that we use when it comes to economic efficiency. Okay. So, a Pareto optimum or efficient allocation is where it's a situation in which no Pareto improvement is possible. So after the allocation, we've realized that it is not possible for us to improve. Okay, there is no way we can have a Pareto improvement or a Pareto superior allocation. If that's the case, then we say that we have a Pareto optimal allocation. Okay. And one thing we need to understand is that when we come to the real world, this uh, concept is very difficult to believe. Meeting the criteria is very difficult. The reason is that when you come to the real world, as soon as you allocate resources, if you embark on a policy, definitely some people will get hit. It is not possible for you to get an allocation where at least one person is being made better and then no one is made worse of this. It is not possible. You definitely have gamers and you definitely have losers. So this concept is, is very strict, like the principle is very strict in that uh, it doesn't only work in the world. Now, uh, for, for the economy to be efficient, okay, before we can say that uh, the economy is very efficient, these three marginal efficiency conditions must be met. Okay, before we, we say that, yes, the economy is extremely performing well, these three marginal uh, efficiencies must be met. So, before we get this Pareto efficient thing, then all these conditions are supposed to be intact before uh, any allocation in the economy is considered as Pareto optimal or efficient. The first one is production efficiency. We are to get production efficiency in the economy, as if we have to consider Pareto optimality. Now, production efficiency means that the economy is producing on the PPA. Okay, we are producing on the PPA. So we are using all the available resources to produce the maximum output that we can produce. Okay, so we should have production efficiency. And there should also be exchange efficiency. Exchange efficiency means that there is no available uh, mutually beneficial trades that can be made between the economic agents. Let's know that uh, there's always uh, true we exchange commodities. Okay, so if up to a point we exchange all these commodities, and then there is no other alternative trade, there's no other alternative exchange where at least one transactor will be made better off without harming the other transactor. Then we, we say that the exchange that we have done is efficient. So before the economy will be efficient, we should have this exchange efficiency. It shouldn't be possible for us to trade in a different way again, where at least one economic agent is made better off without harming anyone. But then if it's possible for us to do some way arrangement where at least one person is made better off without harming the other person then it means that we don't have exchange efficiency so this condition must also be made 
And then the last one is efficiency in compensation of output. The production efficiency means that you are producing on your PPF. Okay. So you are producing on your PPF. But when we talk about the uh, efficiency in composition of output, it's not just about producing on your PPF. When you are producing on your PPF, you need to make sure that the marginal rate of transformation, that is uh, the willingness and then the ability of the firms to exchange one, the production of one good for the other, should be exactly the same as the marginal rate of substitution. That's where the, the, the users of the commodities, the amount of uh, good, the quality of good of one, and that they are willing to sacrifice for an extra unit of the other, must be exactly equal to what the firms are, the quantity of that good that the firms are willing to sacrifice in order to produce an extra unit of the other. So we need to make sure that the marginal rate of transformation is exactly equal to the marginal rate of sub, uh, substitution. So when all these efficiency conditions are met, then we say that, yes, indeed, what we have done is Pareto efficient. So one implication of these conditions is that uh, the Pareto efficiency concept is not just for uh, just a group of people or just one person, but it's capturing the entire economy, it's capturing all households, it's capturing all firms. Okay, so the firms should ensure production efficiency Households should ensure uh, exchange efficiency. They will combine the, the whole economy, combined with the firms and households, to make sure that we have efficiency in the composition of households. So, uh, Pareto optimality captures all the economic agents. It's not just for particular sector, just a group of people. So, if we're able to meet these conditions, then the allocations at that point should be done. To All right, uh, remember the first time we met, we were talking about net present value of uh, the cost of the benefits. We want to embark on the project, a program, or a policy. We are interested in getting a net benefit, a positive net benefit, where the benefits will be more than the cost. So if you are allocating resources and then you get a positive net benefit, then it's more likely have a Pareto efficient allocation net. So we say that there's a, a direct and a positive link between positive net benefits and then Pareto efficiency. What this means is that provided the policy has a positive net social benefit, then it's possible for us to do some transfers and compensations, do some way arrangement to make sure that all those who will be affected by this, uh, this allocation, at least, uh, no one is going to get harmed. We shouldn't have a welfare level that is lower than the initial one. Okay, but then if, if you are embarking on a policy and then the net benefit is negative, it means uh, those who are going to be affected will be uh, incurring more costs than the benefit. If it happens like that, then it is not possible for us to have a Pareto uh, optimum or efficient. That is why, before we embark on the policy, we need to make sure we are having a positive benefit. By having it, it gives an, an indication that there's a presence of uh, Pareto optimality, or there's a potential that we can get the Pareto efficiency from that allocation. So, what we need to understand is that there's always this link between positive net benefit. Before we can get Pareto efficient allocation, then the allocation of that resource should have a positive net benefit. If we get any like that, we get a potential Pareto output. Now, when you think about what when you think about the Pareto efficiency concept. It's, it's very appealing. The concept is nice, but when you come to the real world, uh, it is it is not really like that. It has some issues and challenges that they face. Though uh, conceptually, the thing is good. Practically, it's it's not an easy thing. And these are some of the challenges. Okay? We have informational burden. 
and they see the analyst. Assuming you are just one person uh, doing CBE for a public project, and this project is capturing the entire nation, can you imagine the, the kind of information you, you have to gather and cost and benefit? So you have to get all the areas individuals get uh, what are the, all the impacts, the benefits, the cause. I mean, it's, it's not going to be an easy task. And there are some, the last time we saw that there are some impacts that cannot be quantified. Okay, those that cannot be measured in monetary terms. You have to sit down and, I mean, know how to get out. So it's not, it's not an easy job. So there's always information bridging on the person doing the and not just the information of that, even if you are able to do that, just think of the administrative cost. Okay, think about the cost that we have to care when we do all these analysis. Okay, we have to, we said that if the project has a positive negative benefit, then it is, it is very possible that just a minimum of Oh, so, so as I was saying, uh, we just saw that uh, before we can have the potential parietal optimum allocation, we should have positive net benefits. But then, as we saw, definitely we are going to be generous and generous and generous. So we have to make sure that we are allocating the resources in ways that are at at least more people will be positively impacted. I look at the, the cost of the kind of Financial burden that will come upon the family. So that one too is another issue that we face. And now, uh, <clears throat> another uh, thing is that now, if people are aware that after the policy and the reports that they've been negatively impacted, we have to effect transfers, people are supposed to receive compensations and all that. As long as people see that, you know what they will do. They will under, understate the, uh, the, the benefits and they overstate their cost. Even if the person is being impacted po positively, the person says that no, their cost is too much, their cost is too much, so that, that that person too can receive uh, some, some compensation. Okay? And that, that one is going to affect uh, the policy. So, this one is another issue that uh, and then uh, practically too, whenever the government tries to compensate people, it distorts uh, investment and consumption behavior. Okay, now if I know that because of this policy, I say that I am carrying too much cost, the government is going to compensate me. I, I might even choose not to get. Okay, I might choose not to get. So I guess this. Uh, Comedy drama called Mind Your Language is, is very old. It was done in the UK. I think it was around 1970. There was the, this man, and the teacher was asking him the kind of work that he does. And he, he said that he doesn't work at all. And the teacher asked, well, so How does he live? So those times, there, if you don't work, every week or month, you have to go to the labor commission and then they will pay you. And the man said, said that initially, if as soon as you get a job, they will stop paying you that in the money. And the man said, initially, the work that he was doing, the pay was lesser than the one that uh, he gets from the labor commission. So now he has decided not to work at all. So if I am working and I'm getting 10, and I don't work and I get 15, 60, then it's better I don't work, work at all. So that is what will happen. If people know that because of allocations of allocation of resources, if they state that they are being negatively impacted, the government is going, going to compensate them. They, they will choose to overstate their cost and get those benefits, and then they won't work at all. So
So that is going to affect their work and then the laser schedule. Instead of working, they will rather choose to do the laser. And that is going to distort the investment process. Okay, people are not working. If people are not working, output will fall, and then you see what is going to ha happen. Price will go up. It will have an adverse effect on the tree as a whole. So the, the, this is one issue that is affecting people. Now, uh, we have seen that practically, if you come to the real world, it's very difficult to, be to actually get an allocation where no one is made worse off. It is almost impossible. So we have something called the potential Pareto optimality. Adolf X, it was named after Pascal Berger. For, for this criterion, they, they, they still base their criterion on the Pareto optimality, but then they believe and they accept that definitely after the allocation of resources, some people will be made worse off and others will be made better off. So after the allocation, let's just make sure that those who were made better off will compensate those who were made worse off so that at least, at least, no one will be made worse off than before the, uh, the, the allocation. So assuming initially, uh, the welfare was 10 for all. And then after the allocation, half of the people are now getting the welfare of 20. And then half are now getting welfare of, let's say, 8. So now those people are made worse off because their welfare now is lower than the initial one. So what, what, what the cargo hedge predicts is that we can get a potential Pareto efficient allocation. If those who are better off now, those who are having a welfare of 20, to compensate those who are having, uh, those who is welfare now are lower than the initial one. So if those with the 20 can at least give two units of welfare to those who have eight now, then they will come back to their initial welfare before the allocation. So if it happens like that, then those with the 20 will now come to 18, then those with the eight will go to 10. So people have made better off and no one has been made worse off. I, I, I hope you understand the concept. Okay, so definitely some people will be made worse off, but then uh, we we'll talk to those who are made better off and then they will have to compensate, do something to those who are made worse off so that at least they'll go back to their initial level of welfare without losing anything at all. Okay, without losing anything at all. So at least if we can do that, we have already done the allocation. But then if we can do some policies to make sure that those who were made better off are being compensated, then we can get a, a latter allocation that will be Pareto improving. That will be better than the initial. So that is what the cargo is, is all about. Assuming there's a tax policy. Some people are gaining, others are losing. I mean, here we say that there's no Pareto optimality. But what if we, we, we enact a policy where those who are gaining after the tax policy are compensating those who are losing so that at least they'll go back to their initial level of welfare? Then uh, we can know that we have some Pareto improvement. So the uh, cargo hitch is, is just like the Pareto efficiency, but then uh, the criterion isn't as strict as that of the Pareto efficiency. Here we accept that people are going to do, but then after the losing, let those who are losing compensate these people. We should have some Pareto. Uh, please, I hope you understand. Hello. Yes, sir. Right. Okay, so this is what I was saying. I mean, theoretically, if it's possible for those who are made better off to compensate those who are made worse off, then we say that the outcome is more efficient. So let's look at this example. Now, assuming that 
there's a contraction of the goods. Okay, the government is the buyer, and then the firm. We are causing pollution. So if that be the case, it means that though it's possible the government and then the firm, the construction firm are doing it better off. Those who are living around the area are doing it the worst way. But then we can still get the parental improvements here. We are called the carbon improvement. If at least the government does the buyer and then the construction firm without the seller can come into an agreement and keep on compensating those who are being affected. If that's the case, if they will agree and keep on compensating them, then we can say that the construction of the road is, is cover his improvement. That at least uh, we are, people are getting hurt, but we are compensating them. So, I mean, on the average, no one is uh, at least really losing. So, though the policy will be hurting people because of the compensation we are going to get, we are able to get up. So even even with this, even with the cargo hitch, yeah. it doesn't always work like that practically. After the policy, even if you want to compensate people, they are, they, there are so many cases where the people will not be fully compensated. They wouldn't be fully compensated. Okay. I mean, even if you are supposed to receive thousands, you know, you know our country here. People will receive the card, but those who are supposed to receive the card will only have less than one card, which means that they are still being really questioned. Okay. But then, if we can at least, in theory, hypothetically speaking, uh, try to compensate them, then the card has to be done. Practically, that one too is not that easy. But at least this one is. But now, uh, most of the times, when we adopt policies, okay, we, we, we try to maximize societal welfare, or societal wealth. We aggregate all the people that are affected by the allocation. Then we know that generally, without uh, talking about individual impact for the general on on aggregation we are increasing our welfare we are maximizing it okay though when when you go to the individual level some people are being made rich others are being made poor but then in the eyes of the entire society we are we are getting uh, an increase in welfare so at least at least if we're able to maximize this societal wealth, this societal wealth, then we should have some uh, indirect efficiency here. Those who are becoming so rich can do certain things to assist those who are becoming poor because of their allocation. One thing that they can do is that they can invest their riches and then their poor people will come and also enjoy some. There will be spillover effect from the investment from those who are made Rich. And by doing so, there's going to be an early distribution of income. So the richer in the society are now investing, they are taking the poor people to work for them. So by doing so, you see that indirectly, even those who have made worse off are also receiving something because of that allocation. Okay, because of that allocation. So uh, there's one justification for the carbon hits. I mean, on a general note, we are maximizing our society and we expect a similar effect on the two of it also. And then another justification to you that you see, we don't enact only one policy, we have different policies, different allocations. And all these different allocations will have different gainers and users. So we just group the people into two. We are embarking on 10 policies. It's possible that for five of the policies, the first group will be gainers, and the other group will be users. Then for the next five, the second group will rather be gainers, and then the first group will be users. So you see that on the average, no one is being made worse off. Okay, this person is benefiting from this and losing from that. The other person to the things otherwise. So it will be like on the average, at least we are all gaining somewhere. 
they are all living somewhere. This week, as it just is, some people are doing some people are using. Now they are saying they, they want to cancel the two uh this two thing that they pay on the roof. Some people are gaining, some people are losing. So it's possible the person who gain from the free essay. You take take those people who, who sell the, the bread at uh just two two with at a union sir. You see, it's possible that that person has children who are enjoying the free messages. Now, if they are not paying any to the they, they cannot sell their bread. So you see that they, they, they were gamers with the free SHS. Now they are losing. They basically tax them. So on the average, the person has one So the money that you are supposed to get from selling the bread and use it to pay the child's fees. Now you are not paying the, the fee. So even if you don't get the money from the it doesn't matter on the average. So that is another justification. And also, uh, another one is that if we believe in egalitarianism, where we believe in equal rights and justice for all, so then, I mean, after a policy, we can effect transfers to make sure that we are addressing inequity and an equal distribution of uh, resources. We have already allocated the resources. We've seen those who are being made so we have to effect some compensation. If we believe equality for all, okay, then we have to try and do some transfers, effect compensation that will at least uh, also increase the welfare of those who are in the country. So uh, these are some of the advantages of why people are in favor of the countries. All right, so uh, this uh, discussion, something identify and discuss what the deficiencies associated with the Pareto optimality concept. So we just just try to hands on this. We can do quickly. Cool. All right, please. Any questions? 